Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Chen from Taiwan. It's my great honor to share PFOS in GI ultrasound in WinFocus World Congress 2022. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Most observed GI ultrasound PFOS, I summarize it into six domains. After, at the end of this topic, I would like to share how to avoid these pitfalls. Emergency physicians use ultrasounds to diagnose appendicitis, diverticulitis, intersusception, and extraluminal air dirty ascites from patients having pneumoperitoneum. In order to recognize this common disease, we have to familiar with GI structures. For the sononitomy of bowel wall layers, we should understand that normal bowel walls contain five layers, especially when you use high-resolution linear transducers. These five layers become much clearer. Three bright hyperechoic layers, two anechoic layers. The wall has its normal size. When the size is greater than five millimeters, it is always abnormal. We started from the first GI tract to observe cervical esophagus. It's superficial, so we use linear transducer. We can see the cervical esophagus next to the trachea. Transverse, uh, we scan longitudinal, we can see the tubular structures of the esophagus. It is also possible to observe some movement, like in this video, swallowing. We scan this part to confirm some procedures over the neck, like ET tube intubation and NG tube intubation. Next, we go to EC junction because the thoracic part of esophagus is difficult to observe outside from outside the body. Therefore, we put our transducer over cyphoid process, use lever as window to observe the EC junction. And then sometimes we can see pylorus. Tear the transducer a little bit. We can use lever as window to observe easy junction and stomach, especially when the stomach is distended. It's a good window to observe the stomach. Move the transducer downward a little bit. We can see the entrance rotated. It is also possible to see the entrance pylorus and the duodenum bulb and second portion. It is also possible to observe typical gastric rugae, especially when there is nothing inside the stomach. The rugae structure is much uh, easy to observe. When the stomach is uh, distended by the fluid, it is also possible to observe the detailed information of the GI wall. Uh, some protocols incorporate uh, gastric evaluation in their daily care for critically ill patients. The next GI structure goes to the duodenum. We can start it from transverse scan from pylorus to duodenum. We can also rotate the transducer in sagittally to observe the third portion in between the SMA and delta. When you have patients got distended stomach and the duodenum, you should observe the angle between the SMA and Elta. If its angle is smaller than it should be, you should consider the patient may have SMA syndrome. In this video, we can see the typical landmark Elta and the entrance, then the GI structures passing in between Elta and SMA is the third portion of the duodenum. In these patients having epigastric pain and vomiting, we started our examination from EC junction to the transducer towards stomach. We see the distended stomach. Rotate our transducer. It is also possible to observe from stomach entrance go to the duodenum. We can see the duodenum, the second part of the duodenum is distended. It is also possible to observe the stomach from left flank. You spin as window to see the content of the stomach. The patient was diagnosed to have gastric outlet obstructions.
for the rest part of the GI tract way to start our examination. Before that, we have recognized two patterns of the GI tract. The first one is fold of Cochrane. It's a typical presentation for small intestine. The jejunum has more fold of Cochrane than ileum. It is only possible to see those fold of Cochrane when the bowel structure is distended by the fluid. The other typical pattern comes from hostrations. It belongs to colon, large bowel loops. We start our examination from ascending colon, fixed part, rotated, and then we can see the hostrations as ascending colon. The same principle goes to descending colon. It is also a fixed part of the GI structures. We can see those hostrations. The hostration is much easier to observe when it is filled with fluid, but when it is empty, collapsed, the hostration is not so easy to observe. But in this situation, it's much easier to observe those abnormal findings around the GI tract of the colon, like in this video. The diverticulum is much easier to observe when the GI structure is collapsed. So, where to start our examination for small bowel first or colon first? I recommend to scan fixed part first. Ascending colon, descending colon, and the rectum. Those are retroperitoneal fixed inside the retroperitoneal region. So we started our examination from these three regions. Use bone as our landmark. The palpate ASIS and then scan transversely from ASIS to costal margin. The same to descending colon. And it is also possible to use bladder as our window to observe the rectum. Then go to non-fixed part, transverse colon, and rest part of the uh, small bowel loops using this maneuver. Start the examination from ascending colon first, descending colon, then goes to non-fixed part, transverse colon. When you're familiar with the pattern, it is easier to observe transverse colon based on the hostrations. Some pathologic findings of the GI ultrasound can be summarized into these seven suggestions. <laughs> the wall, the diameter, luminal content, it is able to compress or not the peristalsis and some associated findings. When you encounter patients having right lower abdominal pain, I recommend to scan landmark first. Recognize what landmark, the iliac bone, iliac source muscle, and iliac vessels, and scan over around these regions. We can see these structures, and then shift to linear transducer. We can see this distended appendix just lying immediately to the iliac vessels. It's appendicitis. When you are worrying about patients having intersusception, again, scan landmark first. What is the landmark for intersusception, especially in pediatric patients? Most uh, common type of intersusception in pediatric patients is the idiocolic type intersusception. So we put our transducer on right upper abdomen. We can see these landmarks, liver, kidney, we look these regions. In this case, we see the target. In the other case, we see a pseudo kidney right over here. Before the adult, uh, you should scan systemic rather than these regions because for adult, it's different stories. For GI obstructions, when we are scanning GI obstructions, I recommend to use Professor Wang's method BAM method for GI obstructions. Scan both uh, sides of fixed part of the GI structures. When the proximal side is distended, the distal side is collapsed, then you should consider the obstructions is in between. Take this video as an example. The ascending colon is distended and the descending colon is collapsed. So you should consider some obstruction in between. These patients, old men, have abdominal pain and vomiting. Then we can see 
the bowel loops is distended, the small bowel is distended, no prior surgery. So we scan ascending colon and the second. We see here a distended small bowel loops and going to these regions, abnormal wall thickening of the second. This patient's having to, this patient is diagnosed to have uh, sequel cancers by using BAM method. Ultrasound is helpful to diagnose small bowel obstruction in, obs, in trend oper, oper, operators. The accuracy, the sensitivity and specificity is, is even comparable to CD scans. We use three pairs of the X-ray and the sonos in three different patients you can see. For the ultrasound, it is useful to diagnose gaseless ileus rather than these two patterns. When the bowel wall thickened, we have to recognize its structures. This patient's having fever, abdominal pain, and we can see it's ileocecal valve, and the whole structure is actually ascending colon. The wall is thickened, the certification preserved, and it's coming from the patients having infectious colitis. Let's take the other example. The ward is sinking. The stratification disappears. It's a long segment over sigmoid and descending colon. Use linear transducer. We don't see the typical stratifications over this long segment. So when you have patients presented with this pattern of sonal anatomy, you should consider this situation. Ischemic colitis. Let's take these two videos as comparison. The video one is from myself. When I recording this, I ha happen to have infectious enterocolitis, so it's my transverse colon, swollen, symmetric, with preserved stratification. The other patients, the descending colon, the wall is thickened without adequate stratification. This coming from a symmetric loss of stratification from patients having ischemic colitis. The wall thickenings, let's take at these two comparisons. Wall thickening with preserved stratification and symmetric is coming from infectious colitis. In this patient, the sigmoid colon wall thickening, but it's asymmetric. The stratification is not so clear. So when you encounter patients having asymmetric wall thickening without stratification, you should consider some new growth. In this case, sigmoid colon cancer. We can see these small bowel loops distended. The wall is thickened. When we observe more of the segment, we see some abnormality right over here. We zoom in the structures. We see the hyperechoic gas located around the bowel wall. We call it circle sign. When you encounter patients having circle sign, it is always abnormal. It's coming from patients having pneumatosis intestinalis. The other wall thickening. Let's take a look at these bowel loops. It looks like fold of Kirkring, but the fold is too fat. Edematous, not a typical fold of Kirkring. When we see these patterns, use linear transducer, the pattern is quite obvious. Those four of the characters become edematous. When you have patients having this presentation, you should always consider uh, some immunocompromised situations. In this patient, lupus and arthritis. Adequate compression and maneuver is quite important. This patient having right lower abdominal pain, but when we scan in this maneuver, we scan nothing. We observe nothing abnormal. But when we apply some pressure, we see some abnormality right over here. And then use this pressure, steady compression, and then rotate our transducer. We see this retrocecal appendix distended swollen at its tip. Over here, the appendix, the same pattern as our sonographic finding. So, Applied state decompression is quite important when observe the GI tract abnormality.
Scan transversely for most part of the GI structure is quite important because in that way we can observe the patterns like CT scan. In this case, we started from second base, the landmarks and the appendix. We see the appendix is circular shape. Some associated findings quite important. The terminal alien and the appendix we observed in this young man and having right low abdominal pain. Then we observe some painful uh, sensations coming from this enlarged lymph nodes. Some associated findings coming from the fat. In this case, we have diverticulitis. In the other case, we have epiploic appendicitis. This one, we have a symmetric wall thickening, like here, echogenic fat, and the dome sign. In this case, the wall is normal, the fat is echogenic. It's coming from patients having epiploic appendicitis. It is also possible to see some extraluminal air in patients having pneumoperitoneum from liver service or when you apply the pressure you can see the air disappear according to curtain sign or like sliding patterns in what we observed in chest it's EPSS or we call it gut point it is also possible to see dirty ascites from patients having perforation of the GI tract the dirty ascites may be located above the liver around the paracotic artery and over the pelvic region we can see a lot of echogenic materials floating inside the peritoneal cavity associated finding is quite important like this one we can see the gi structures and echogenic fate and in this one the same transverse scan longitudinal scan we can see this hyperechoic area of the mesenteric fate is coming from patients having epiploic appendicitis. Ultrasound is also useful to guide hernia reduction, especially when we understand its track, then under real tight uh, guidance, we can reduce the hernia into peritoneal cavity. So it's my advice to avoid those people when performing GI ultrasound. The first, you have to recognize GI sonar anatomy from esophagus, stomach, small bowel loops, and the colon. Pay attention to those wall layers and the diameter of the bowel size. Scan on landmarks, no matter it's from cervical area, easy junction, right lower abdominal part, or rectum transfers, scanning a CT scan and compress only when it is needed and learn those common pathological findings like what we just introduced and especially notice some indirect findings sometimes those indirect findings can lead us to find those direct abnormalities thank you for your attention